Okay, good morning, South Bay Bible Church. Uh, again, 10.30, Sunday morning. Uh, it's time for our corporate worship. Um, so we all know, right, that uh, ever since uh, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the New Testament age, uh, Christians celebrate uh, the Sabbath on the day that our Lord Jesus Christ resurrected, and that's Sunday. And this tradition right, has been there since very, very beginning. When God created the, uh, the entire universe, uh, he called us uh, to observe uh, the Sabbath day. Um, and the whole purpose is not for him, it's for us, right? For us to rest, for us to remember, refresh, restore, and recommit. So, uh, so actually, before this uh, uh, service, as, as, as many of you know that we, the the, the worship team and tech team uh, usually get get together, uh, and we we try to make sure all the technical stuff works okay, and we pray uh, to prepare ourselves. So today, um, in our prayer, I I, I actually pass this Sebastian prayer says that, uh, yeah, we want to commit, dedicate uh, what we prepare to our death in heaven. It, it's not the performance, right? It's actually uh, worship in the spirit and in truth. I, I, I feel that it's a, it's a blessing, it's a privilege, right? When, when Jesus said that to, to this woman, in Samaritan many, many years ago. Uh, it doesn't matter where we worship, how we worship, but what really matters is that we worship our Father God in the spirit and in truth, right? So with that said, I think, you know, let's all unite our heart with that uh, uh, recognition and awareness, we get together to worship our God. So um, I, I pick up, I pick, a, a, let's go to scripture reading. Right? I pick a Psalm 98 uh, for this week's um, uh, worship service right? as a scripture reading. Uh, so again, right, you know, we are called to worship. We are summoned by, by God to worship in order to enjoy him enjoy him himself, enjoy his provision, his protection, his guidance and the intimacy with him, All right? So would you please uh, join me, right? To read this uh, passage together. And as we read it through, we, don't, we just don't read with our voice, but with our heart, right? Going through what the, the, psalm, the psalm is saying, right? All right, so you can, you can speak, you can, on your own, right? But while I'm reading through it, you, I, I really encourage you to also read it, all right? Um, if you are able to, all right? So Psalm 98, let me read it. Uh, verse one to verse nine, a beautiful song again. It says, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked the salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. So shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the heart with the harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord the King. Let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness 
and the peoples with equity. When we worship, we worship God for who he is and also for what he has done. He has done marvelous things. And the most important thing, the salvation, right? The salvation. The salvation brings in the gospel. Or I should say the other way around, right? So gospel has been uh, in motion since very beginning and is still progressing, right? And uh, one day we're going to see our Lord uh, Jesus Christ face in face and uh, live with, uh, and God will be with us forever, right? So the gospel in motion. So we, as we worship, we sing the songs, we we, we read it, the scripture, we listen to the sermon, we pray. It's all around us, right? Around gospel, which is still emotion and which benefits us. It's retold and it's reenacted and it's projected in our worship. It's really a privilege, isn't it? All right. So I know that. Uh, in our midst, uh, you know, we could go in through our daily life. So would you please at this moment, um, regardless uh, uh, how, what you have been going through this past week, all right, let's all bring uh, a true self, ourself, to worship him together. We can cast out our burden. Uh, we can, we can, we can cry out to, to him and we can uh, commit ourselves to him. Uh, we can praise him, all right? So with that said, I'd like to invite you to join me uh, with the word of prayer together as a, as, a, as a group, as a body, all right? Let's pray, all right? Father God, we are so grateful that we are called your descendant, your son. Um, and thank you for sending your begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to work out this salvation uh, for each one of us. And we are still going through that journey, and that journey uh, with the promise that we will reach that end uh, when you come. And and we, as we go through it, we. In, we are trying to learn and to enjoy, to taste, to foretaste what we're going to go through in heaven. So accept our praise, accept our prayer. Uh, you know each individual, you know what they are going through, what their need. Lord, would you please just satisfy each one of us according to your mercy, to your abundance. Again, I pray that, Lord, you will be glorified your heart will be pleased as we worship you together. Accept our praise, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So today we're going to do this all in life. All right. So I'm going to hand this over to the worship team. All right. Um, and please join your voice with them to sing the song together. Yeah, so we're at David Lay's house, and yeah, we're doing this live. Um, yeah, I just, well, we're going to play Build My Life, and I guess uh, I thought that, you know, there's been a lot of, like, unknowns in this season of my life, what with Omicron, and um, I'm, I'm dating a med school student. Yes, that <laughs> causes a lot of unknowns. Um, and, yeah, but I just wanted to, like, encourage us to, like, well, I chose this song because, like, even in all these unknowns, we like, like I've, I've found, mm, I guess, joy in like trying to like build my life on the Lord, like the solid rock, the foundation. And so, yeah, we're going to play this song now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 
song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
you so much, Chris and Kevin, um, Will, for leading us in a time of worship. Let's just pray um, to, to just thank the Lord again for that reminder and that truth. Let's pray. God, I thank you. Mm. Thank you that throughout the storms and uncertainties that we face all the time in our life here on earth, that you are calling out to us in the midst of the storm to trust in you, to find our hope in you, to build our life and find our security in you and you alone. So God, we place that stake in the ground right now as a church family today, that we are choosing to follow you today, right now. We're choosing to, to seek you right now. We're choosing to desire and, and, and turn our hearts and our affections towards you right now. So God, we thank you because that desire, even that act of turning, that we don't have the strength to do that on our own, but that is something that you have deposited into our hearts. So we thank you for giving us faith. We thank you for giving us your son. We thank you that we can find our whole life in you. So we commit the rest of this service to you, God. Speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So <laughs> good morning. I think I can, um, I think we're, we're good to go here. Let me see if I can figure this, this out. It's been a while since I preached live uh, through Zoom, particularly, um, but it's, it's a joy. You know, Chris and Chris and Kevin actually um, wanted to lead worship live, and I was like, "Let's let's all just do everything live. This is great." <laughs> and so I'm happy to follow their lead on this this morning. So thank you again to the worship team. Thank you to Uncle Gene, and thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, it is a good morning to be worshiping live together. You know, it it is a um, a special day in America. It's Super Bowl Sunday for those of you who don't know. It's also the day before Valentine's Day, right? Valentine's Day is tomorrow. So I hope that all of you guys who are coupled up are uh, able to <laughs> do something special together either today or tomorrow. Um, so thank you so much for joining today. It's a, it's a, big, it's a big day in America. Um, <laughs> uh, my condolences, first of all, to all you uh, Niners fans out there. I'm sorry. But yeah, <laughs> anyways, in addition to the Super Bowl being today, there's another huge athletic competition happening right now. It's the Winter Olympics. The Winter Olympics are also happening right now. There's a lot of sports happening right now. Um, you might be, um, you see that picture in the, the upper left corner. You see all of our USA superstar athletes there. Um, you might be familiar with um, the Asian man <laughs> in the picture. His name is... Nathan Chen, right, Nathan Chen, 22-year-old figure skater from Utah. I, he was hyped up so much. I remember the last Olympic Games in Korea. He was hyped up as the, the quad king, the one who would win gold. And in the last Winter Games in 2018, before the pandemic, everything, um, in the last Winter Games, some of you might already know this, he actually didn't do so well. You know, he, he fell in the team event. He fell in his own individual event. He kind of like was, uh, he buckled under the pressure of the Olympics. And you can see the, the look of disappointment on his face. And so this Winter Games in Beijing 2022, it was like a redemption, a, a, a second shot, a take two. He trained for four years really hard, getting his mind and his body right for the competition. And guess what? You guys might know this. If you've been following the news, following the Olympics, you know that he actually did it. He redeemed himself. He won gold. He had the highest score, his own personal best, which was a world record score um, in the individual event. And he won gold. He took home the gold. It was, it's really great to see um, someone who's gone through such disappointment, work really hard, train for four years, and then finally achieve his goal. You see that cute little golden panda that he received for winning the Olympics. Um, you know, sports and competition are, are filled. It doesn't take long to find stories, inspirational stories of perseverance, of overcoming certain challenges, and even just the joy of winning. And, and the Bible is, is, no, is no different. The Bible is full of metaphors and lessons from our everyday life. You'll see Jesus and even the apostles teach using illustrations 
from daily life, like farming, about sowing seed, about growing grapes in a vineyard, about nature, about the sun, the moon, the mountains, the rivers, about even politics, about the kingdoms of earth and of heaven, even family relationships, about how we are, in a, we are the children of God, right? But also in the Bible, you'll find illustrations in athletic competition. So this morning, special day in America, let's Let's look to the Lord and ask him to speak to us. So let me, I'm going to commit this time to the Lord again, just this portion and, and ask that you bow your heads and pray. Let's, so let's pray and commit this time to the Lord. Let's pray. God, I thank you again. I thank you again um, that your word is alive. And right now, God, we are, we're looking to, to eat from your word. We're looking to be filled with your word, to be encouraged, to be inspired, to be convicted, um, so yeah, God, do what only you can do in this moment. Do what only you can do, because you are God and we are not. So we acknowledge, God, that you, you are the one doing the work of ministry. And so, God, this is our act of worship, continuing to worship you. We, we open our hearts to your word this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So today we're going to be talking about the prize. The prize. Our text for today is found in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Feel free to turn in your own Bibles, um, but I have the text here for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. Verse 24 says this. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. And, and so we'll stop there for now. But um, this, this is a really inspiring passage in scripture. Um, I feel like this has been uh, hammered into a lot of youth groups, a lot of uh, even sports teams. Um, this idea of strict training, the strict training is what I underlined here. Um, the discipline in Greek, it's the word enkratuamai. It's to exercise complete control over one's desires and actions. And essentially, it's just self-control. So everyone who, who trains to run a race goes into strict training, practicing self-control, right? Um, in a spiritual sense, it's to control your, your sinful desires. And 1 Corinthians is written by the Apostle Paul. And so Paul here is saying, you Corinthians, think about an athletic competition. <laughs> think about a race where there's a bunch of people running the race. All of these individual athletes, they put so much work and years spent training and sacrificing all just for this one race. And what he's saying here is that the odds of winning are actually pretty narrow, pretty slim. Only one gets the prize, right? Even today's the Super Bowl, only one team's going to win. In the Olympics, only one person's going to get gold. There's only one prize. There's no participation trophies here, right? And so he says, they train so hard to get this one prize that's not even guaranteed, right? They, they train and sacrifice to get a crown that will not last. But we, we who follow Christ, we put ourselves and we practice self-control to, to train ourselves, to control our desires so that we will get a crown that will last forever. This is about self control, isn't it? Strict training, self-control. Continues on in 26. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. And see, Paul, he continues on this metaphor. He gets even more intense. He brings up the sport of boxing, um, not just like running aimlessly in a circle, um, just going for a jog, not just shadow boxing the air, just training. No, he strikes his own body. I strike a blow to my own body. He gets so serious. He sh it shows the seriousness of his spiritual discipline that he compares boxing training to not be enough. He has to actually force himself to make his body his slave. And so what he's doing is he's He's comparing this um, idea of boxing training and running the race to spirit, his spiritual life. 
And he says here, after I've preached to others, I myself do not want to be disqualified for the prize, meaning that he's take, he has to preach to others, but also preach to himself and then take his own spiritual teachings to heart. And see, so we see here that Paul takes this very seriously. And, and we know that being a Christian requires rigorous training. But, oh, you know, what about grace? What, you know, saved by grace, not by work? Yeah, it's true. It's true. I love this quote, though, by Dallas Willard, theologian, pastor. It says, grace is not opposed to effort. It is opposed to earning. Grace is not opposed to effort. It is opposed to to earning, meaning that we cannot earn our way into the good graces of God. We cannot earn our salvation, but it doesn't mean we don't do nothing, right? Grace is not opposed to effort. Is, there's a lot of work that goes into being a follower of Christ. There's real work and there's real effort and real dedication and sacrifice and training that is a part of our spiritual life. And if you want to become a, a mature growing, thriving, spiritual follower of Jesus to be more like Christ, it's going to take effort. It's going to take some work and on your part. And the work isn't going to save you. But once you're saved, experiencing the love and the grace and the mercy of God, that's the lifetime of work. To know God, to walk by faith, that's, that's the work. So yeah, we train like a runner running the race. We, we train like a boxer preparing for their next match. Um, and, you know, sermon done, right? That's a pretty good, nicely wrapped up message. You know, train harder, try harder, train rigorously to, to preach to, to others and preach to yourself. That's a pretty good message right there. But again, we're, ta we're talking about the prize this morning. We're talking about the prize. What's the prize, guys? What is the prize? Because when I thought about this, what, the, what is the prize that Paul is talking about here? I, I think, first of all, I think oftentimes we think that we are the prize. <laughs> We're so self-centered. We think we are the prize. That the prize of, of doing all of our spiritual disciplines, what's the prize of that? That our life, get, we get more control over our sinful desires. That's the prize. That we, have a, we feel better about ourselves. That's the prize. Or we work diligently and we, we check off all of our Bible reading plans. Or we go to church every week. And that's the prize is we feel good. And we feel less guilty about all those other things that we're doing in our life. That's the prize, right? I, I, I think we, can, we get the prize mixed up. Here, Paul is saying the prize is, is clearly preaching the gospel. The prize is to preach the gospel. That is the prize. Um, and so how, you know, what does that look like? How, how do we obtain this prize? How do we preach the gospel? That's super important because I think that's where we often get tripped up. We get tripped up even the prize of thinking it's our, about ourselves. It's not. The prize is not about ourselves. But we even get tripped up. We know what the prize is to preach the gospel, to preach it well. We get confused about the how. How are we supposed to preach the gospel? So we're going to look at the previous passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and look at the context of this passage to see the how. So here's the context of our passage. Verse 19. You can turn in your Bibles if this text is small. I apologize. Verse 19. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave. Paul is, is talking here, right? I am free and belong to no one. I've made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew. To win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law. Though I myself am not under the law. So as to win those under the law, those to those not having the law. I became like one not having the law, though I'm not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak. To win the weak, I've become all things to all people, so that by all possible means, I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. This is a familiar passage to some of us here. This is an inspiring passage. Paul writing this letter to the church in the city of Corinth, a large influential city in the Roman Empire located in that nation of Greece, right? The city itself, Corinth, is multi-ethnic. It's multicultural, filled with Greeks, Romans, Jews, and Paul is saying, this is, this is how I approach spreading the gospel. This is how I approach preaching and teaching about Jesus. 
to the Jews, I become like a Jew. It's funny that Paul says, I became like a Jew, because for those of you who don't know, Paul is, he himself is Jewish, right? He's, a, he's, he's, he was a Pharisee. He was Jew of Jews, according to himself. But he's saying here to the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. And the word became, I've underlined it here in the passage, became is the Greek word ginomai. Ginomai. And that's the same word that the Apostle John uses in his prologue in John chapter one that we talked about earlier in January. The word became flesh dwelt among us, right? The word became flesh, the word ginomai, flesh. And, I, and Paul is saying, I, ginomai, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. And then continues, uh, to those under the law, those who are very strict un, uh, uh, under the law, uh, the Torah, um, also referring to a sect of Jews, I became like one under the law. Even he understands, I am not <laughs> I'm myself under the law. And then to those not under the law, he's referring to Gentiles, though anyone who's not under the Torah covenant of God, I became like a Gentile. Um, Though I'm not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law. He's saying there are limits to how much I become like a Jew, to become like someone under the law, to become like a Gentile. And then to the weak, you know, we don't know exactly what he's referring to. It could be um, spiritually weak, someone who's, who's, sin, who's living a sinful life, or physically weak, those who are outcast of the religious society or society as a whole, right? I, I think it's probably more of that to become more of an outcast of society, to become weak, I became weak, to win the weak. All things to all people, so that by all possible means, he might save some. It's inspiring. This is Paul's guiding principle in preaching the gospel. And, and theologian Craig Blomberg, he says this, um, Paul does not assume that all aspects of culture are inherently evil, but practices what has come to be called the contextualization of the gospel, changing the form of the message precisely in order to preserve its content. Then Christianity stands the best chance of being understood and even accepted. Right? So what Paul is saying here is that I'm going to speak the language of whoever I'm talking to. And that's the idea of contextualization. Right, and so we look back at our um, passage, the passage about you know strict training, self control, um, and and uh, training like an athlete, a runner, or a boxer. Guess what, guys? Those illustrations, <laughs> those aren't random. Those are not random illustrations. Paul is becoming a Corinthian to win some Corinthians. He's becoming like one of the people in Corinth. Why? Here's, here's what Paul doing here. See, in the ancient, um, ancient region of Corinth, um, they held something called the, the, let me pronounce this right, Ith, Ithmian Games. The Ithmian Games. It's kind of like the Olympic Games. You know how the Olympic Games happen every four years? Well, these Ithmian Games happened in Corinth. And they happened every other year. So every two years, there was this huge athletic competition where athletes from all across the Greek region of the Roman Empire or ancient Greece would come and compete in these games. And the games included racing, running the race, and boxing, and other things. But these were the two major things. And the winners would receive a crown, a crown of pine needles. You know, you think of the Olympics, you think of the laurel crown that the winners receive. Um, you think of even, you can think of ancient Caesar with the crown. Um, these are the, these were adorned on the, uh, the winning athletes. They would win um, these wreaths. And, you know, uh, it was really popular, really popular. Athletes everywhere from all across Greece would come to Corinth because Corinth was the, always the same host city for these Ithmian games. Every every other year just like how the olympics are happening right now uh, we're all looking and we're inspired by these athletes in the city of corinth there would be these games where the athletes would run the race and receive a prize there'd be athletes who box and train so if it's if paul was not if paul was in uh, writing to corinth he's familiar with the city of corinth um he would know maybe they're in a, a city Right now, they're in an off year. They're in a training mode. Or maybe the games are going on right now. He's talking their language, right? And what's really interesting here is um, in, in, these, in, these, uh, in these games, uh, there's only 
one winner. <laughs> There's only one winner. There's not like a, a gold wreath to win and then a silver wreath to win and a bronze wreath to win. No, there's only one wreath to win. There's no gold medal, silver medal, bronze medal. There's just one pine wreath and only the one winner received it. You see how Paul here is using the what's going on in the city of Corinth to speak their language, right? To speak their language. Paul is contextualizing to the Corinthians in this passage right now. He's speaking to them. He's relating to the athletic competition that happens every other year and using it as a way to illustrate some portion of the spiritual life, some part of the message of the gospel. See, this is what contextualization looked like. This is what it looks like, right? You all run a race as runners run. Only one gets that wreath, right? Only one gets that pine needle prize. Run in such a way to get the prize spiritually. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. You might look around in the city of Corinth and see athletes working and training. They do it all to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Do not be, do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. It's not a random illustration. There are boxers in the city of Corinth that come and fight. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I've preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Paul's contextualizing his message to this, the people of Corinth talking about self-control, rigorous training, right? And even now we can look at this. It takes training. It takes effort to do the work of contextualizing the gospel, to making it make sense to those that we come in contact with, to different peoples and different cultures who come from different backgrounds. Something um, really interesting that happened this week, um, uh, talk show comedian host, Stephen Colbert, um, he was, doing his normal show like he does every weeknight. Um, but his guest was a pop singer and she actually took the reins of the conversation of, of the interview. And she started to interview the interviewer. <laughs> it was kind of funny. Um, and she asked him a question about the connection, not just like, why are you so funny, but actually about his own Christian faith and his comedy. It was really interesting. And a lot of pastors spread and shared this video um, this past week. Um, and as he was approached and interviewed um, about the connection between his faith, being a Christian, and his comedy, he gave a really powerful and eloquent answer. Um, he said that, I always remember this now, he said, death does not defeat. He said, death does not defeat. He said, we can have, we can have all these fears in our life, um, but to be able to cling and have faith and to know that death does not defeat gives us strength to laugh at our fears. And, you know, it was such a, a great answer and uh, you received a round of applause. And even I was inspired by that too. Um, death does not defeat. That's the connection between his faith and his comedy. Um, two things that I, 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 was, I noticed from this whole interaction. First is someone approached him as a Christian. Someone else knew that he was a Christian and asked him about his faith. Someone asked him. And then number two, when someone asked him, he was prepared. He had a, a pretty well thought out answer. He had a very thoughtful answer. And I think that took work. It didn't just, he didn't just think of that at the top, like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Every aspect of that took work. To make it known that, known publicly that he is a Christian so that this person would would come and ask him about his faith. That took work. But also to, to have an answer, to have thought about something, to have a thoughtful response, that takes work, right? That's the work of contextualization. He's not at a church right there. He's on late night television, and he's contextualizing the gospel to thousands of viewers and people. And I think that is the hard work that is required for all believers, the work of contextualizing. It's hard, it's hard to strike that balance, but that's the work that we have to do, to live in the balance of being righteous and respectful. And when we do that, we're able to contextualize better. It's because it's easy to go to either extremes when we think about preaching and being uh, 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 someone who evangelizes and, and teaches about Jesus, right? It's easy to go to either extreme. Either you're 100% Christian and you talk Christianese and use all these phrases that only people that have grown up in church understand, 
or you're hundred percent in the world, never at church. You don't like being at church. Um, hundred percent worldly carnal. You want to say relevant, whatever it is. Um, either one is an echo chamber. Either one, you never have to work on contextualizing because everyone talks and thinks the same thing, but that isn't the example set forth by Christ. And it's not the example set forth by Paul. He says, you have to live in this balance of doing that work, training to be righteous, but also respectful, right? Um, to contextualize the story of the gospel, the story of God, the truths about the spiritual life. You have to be righteous and respectful. See that Paul was saying, I become all things to all people, but there are limits, right? We are, he's still under the law of Christ, right? We shouldn't do church or live out our faith in such a way that alienates those who, right, who are lost to hearing the message of the gospel. Again, um, theologian Craig Blomberg says this, when participating in any one of these uh, cultural activities, when participating in any one of these would inherently compromise the gospel, Christians must refrain. Where abstaining would inappropriately distance believers from their non-Christian friends and neighbors, they should participate. So just take that and, and, and see that for, for what it is right now. There's, um, there's a way where we want to shelter ourselves from the influence of sinful brokenness in, in, in our culture and in our societies, right? And it's easy. We send kids to private school, to Christian school. We, we only listen to Christian music, read Christian literature. Um, and we stay in this Christian bubble, right? But sometimes when we abstain and we distance ourselves from our non-Christian friends and neighbors, we are limiting the, the reach of the gospel. That is what uh, this theologian, and this is what the idea of contextualization found in 1 Corinthians 9 is talking about. When participating in any one of these would compromise the gospel, know what will limit your and hinder your witness, either in a negative or positive way. If you, if you do something and you look and you, you bring shame and you, you, you tarnish the message of the gospel, don't do it. Don't do that. You know, it's, it's fairly obvious. All those, those vices that, that are obvious to society, um, lying, cheating, stealing, getting into addiction and, uh, and, and injustice, all of these things that are immoral on an on a objective level, if those things, you're participating in those things, it's going to compromise the gospel. Stop doing it right? But there are other things that are not immoral, they're just different, that are not associated with being a Christian, but it's not bad. These things, if you don't do it, would distance yourself from those who need to hear the gospel. Just try it, learn about it, participate in it, contextualize the gospel in that setting, right? Um, so, there's, there's a way that politics obviously has infiltrated and corrupted the message of the gospel here in America on both sides, left and right, Republican, Democrat, right? And we see that the message of the gospel is being polluted all, a lot of times with political overtones, right? So we must repent of either one when, we, when our sinfulness, our brokenness compromises the message of the gospel. Or when we, we shy away from interacting with those who are different than us and they, they don't receive the message of the gospel because we are not the ones who are bringing it to them, we must repent of that too. We have to live in such a way where we hold on to the integrity of the calling, the covenant, the holiness, the righteousness that we are called to live, to honor God in the way that we live, but also be respectful of the customs and the society at large around us, not compromising on either one. Right? So that by some way, some miracle of God, that the lost will be found. So we can't lose sight of the prize to preach the gospel to the lost. And as you know, the Winter Olympics are, are happening right now. Right? Um, so those athletes in the top, uh, the top left corner, they are the superstar athletes of the USA. Right? You, you might know uh, Mommy Biney, the African-American speed skater, Sean White, who retired from snowboarding this Olympics. We talked about Nathan, Nathan Chen and, and Chloe Kim, the, the gold medalist, uh, half pipe snowboarder. Um, do you know the blonde woman in the middle? You know who this is? Uh, 
It's Michaela Schifrin. She's a downhill skier, a downhill skier. And she's the defending gold medalist uh, of her uh, of, of slalom, the one where you go zigzagging downhill really fast, like 70 miles per hour. And um, it's four years again. So she's defending one four years in between the Olympics, training, waiting, waiting to, to repeat as gold medalist. Um, and some of you might know this, this Olympic Games has not gone her way. She fell in the first two events. First, only 11 seconds into her race, she fell. And the second time, second one after that fall, her second race, only five seconds in and she fell. And this is a picture of her after she fell in her second race. Um, she stayed there just, just really in shock and in grief of what happened, falling. She's, she's the best in the world, defending gold medalist and fell first two races. And she stayed there on the side of the track, on the side of the ski slope for 20 minutes, just in shock, in grief about having her Olympic dreams dashed, right? And you see just the emotions, um, just even, you can't see her face, but just with her whole body language, you can see her emotions. But this picture, this is the picture that brings hope, that someone came to her side. You see, at that point, the, her coach knew that the prize wasn't the gold medal. It wasn't to repeat as the gold medalist of her, uh, of her event. The prize at this moment was to provide support and comfort, to be there for her. That's the prize. The prize is the person, the person. The prize is the person. And for the Christian, the prize to see people, the lost, to be found in Christ. It isn't just some temporal earthly prize. It isn't just a wreath, a pine wreath that will wither and fade. The prize that Paul is referring to here is the prize of preaching the gospel and seeing the lost welcomed into the family of God. That is why we train. That is why we do all of the things that we do as a Christian in our spiritual life, the work, the hard work of walking by faith, the hard work of reading scripture and praying and following Christ, of walking in the light, of pouring over and studying the scriptures, of being in communion with God and praying and worshiping. We train and we work for the prize. And see, the good news is that we have so much to offer a world that is chasing after pine needles. And it's that eternal hope in Christ, the crown that lasts forever. And so take heart, church, take heart, church family, all the work and all this training, all the self-control that, that we exhibit, all the fight and tears spent wrestling with the Lord, we have the prize of eternal life, and we want to give that to those who are lost. So to do that, we live in the balance of being righteous, being respectful. Let's pray. God, I thank you again. I thank you again for saving us, for choosing us, for somehow giving us faith to follow after you. And God, we repent, repent of ways that we've kept you for ourselves, our own needs. God, turn our eyes towards those who need you. Even in our, in our own church family, God, help us to care for one another and their needs, not just our own individual selves. God, we repent of our selfishness, our self-centeredness. Use us, God. Fill us, anoint us with your spirit so that we could contextualize this message in some way that the loss will be found. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
the Lord is the world out there, Lord, that God needs new life, Lord, needs new hope, needs new power, God needs your breath. And so, Lord, we ask that you come, Lord, that you breathe your breath across upon our lives, Lord, that your breath will fill us, Lord, with new life and new creation, new possibilities, God, and God, that you can come and make all things new. And so, Lord, we surrender ourselves to you, Lord, however you want us to build our lives, Lord, we surrender that to you, Lord, our, our choices, our decisions, Lord, our thoughts, and even ourselves, we give wholly over to you, God. And Lord, I'm reminded, Lord, of what you said to Peter, that upon this rock you will build our, your church. Lord, upon this rock, Lord, upon this church that is filled of people, Lord, who are sinners and yet redeemed by you, God, who found life in you, life in you, God. And so, Lord, just as we build our lives upon you, Lord, you will build <laughs> your church upon us. And so, Lord, we ask that you come and pray this in Jesus' name. Again, what a beautiful song, Hymn of Heaven. Um, I remember the one one verse in the lyrics says, "There will be a day where death is no more. There will be a day uh, all will bow down before Him, um, and that's a day of the Lord, the day of the Lord." Um, yeah, it's kind of funny, right? Uh, it's, it's kind of encouraging and funny. I feel. Uh, yeah, that day is is what we are looking forward to, and uh, and that's a prize uh, preparing for us, and it's, we are guaranteed to win that prize as long as we continue working on it. Um, yeah, that day is is beautiful. Uh, I still remember. Well, that day, you know, there won't be any uh, uh, light need, needed, because you know what, the Lord will light. We will shine for his own temple. It's funny to, to say to, uh, to, to, to Liz, hey, you know, Liz, you're going to lose your job uh, working for PG&E there, right? There won't be a need for PG&E, uh, but you all have the better job, and we all do. Right? <laughs> uh, so so it, it's beautiful, it's beautiful. What uh, we can look forward to that. and and. Uh, and that day, in a sense, we are pre-tasting it uh, also for us to encourage one another. Although it's, it's not necessarily easy, but a grace will be always sufficient because it has never been easy or our God would not have to send his only son, Jesus Christ, to become the flesh for us. But, but it's hopeful. It is hopeful. So let's uh, encourage one another, support one another. Um, not just the brothers and sisters in, in the church, in, in SBBC, but people outside of this social, this group, all right? Uh, so let's uh, um, be mindful and uh, be, uh, be loving, be gracious to ourselves, because God is gracious to ourselves, to us, right? And also be gracious to others. Thank you, uh, Pastor Sebastian, for the Word of God today. So um, just a couple of things to remind everyone and to encourage each one of us. First of all, uh, our next in-person meeting is scheduled to be uh, uh, in, uh, in March on the 13th, right? Uh, and uh, we are aiming at it, uh, though at the same time we'll continue to watching over the uh, pandemic situation, right? So uh, March 13th is what uh, our next in-person meeting day is going to be. Right. Um, <clears throat> the next slide, uh, I also to close, I also would like to uh, um, encourage one another and remind uh, each other that uh, God, it, God actually bless us and he provides us everything that we need so richly, right? That we, he also give us a gift, a gift to give, a gift to give, because the, tr the fact that the, when we are able to give, that, that's the time we reach the highest point of our pleasure, of our joy, of our satisfaction. 
So may God continue to bless you and thank you for giving uh, to support the ministry, for supporting people who are in need. All right. Uh, with that, uh, let us let me invite Pastor Sebastian up to uh, give the benediction. Close this worship service. Yeah, thank you, Uncle Gene. Let's close with a benediction from uh, 1 Thessalonians 5. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So God, we pray for you to keep us uh, safe, keep us righteous, to keep us holy um, as we go out into this world that needs you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Amen.